morning, everyone. Um, people are still streaming in, so let's give it another minute, and then I'll introduce Arash, and we can uh, start the webinar. Thanks for being here. All right, well, it stayed steady for a second, so I will, I will start. Um, good morning, uh, I'm Dan Maroney. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona and I'm, I'm hosting this webinar. Um, this morning, uh, uh, thank you for coming to attend uh, Arash Roshan uh, uh webinar on FPGA programming. Um, this is one of a series of monthly webinars that we host as part of um, an NSF awarded program called the, the Black Hole Pyre or Partnerships in International Research and Education. Uh, we, have, we have webinars on a variety of topics and you can see a list of upcoming topics at, at our website, uh, bhpyre.arizona.edu. Uh, today's webinar will last an hour. Uh, at the end, we'll be giving time for questions and you can share those questions through the uh, chat feature of your of your Zoom connection. Um, at the end, this session will become available on YouTube. Uh, and if you'd like to see what other webinars we've had, they're available via YouTube on our project website. Again, bhpire.arizona.edu. Um, at the end, uh, Harash will have a uh, survey in his slides and we uh, request that you help us out uh, in preparing these webinars by filling out that very brief survey. Um, I think because of the number of people that are involved, it's probably impossible for you to uh, vocalize, by the way, this is set up into the audio, but um, just in case, it's good to keep yourself muted. Um, and uh, uh, if you're finding you have bandwidth problems and you have your video on, you might turn it off. Um, and uh, uh, I will be watching questions come into the chat over the course of the day and curating them, or of course of the hour and curating them. If you, if you have any questions, just share them via the, the Zoom window. Um, and I think that's it. So with no further ado, let me introduce Arash. Thank you, Dan. So it's a great honor and a privilege to have this webinar on FPGA programming and its application in radio astronomy. So uh, in this webinar, I'm going to provide an overview of what is FPGA, what does it stand for, and why do we use FPGAs? There are some other alternatives, uh, there are some other processors, but so why do we go with FPGAs? And then I'm going to talk about uh, FPGA, uh, how do we approach FPGA designing, and what are the steps to program FPGA, and I'm going to bring an example of a tool flow that, has, that intends to uh, facilitate an uh, FPGA, uh, FPGA designer's work and speed up the process. I'm going to bring some examples of F FPGAs in radio astronomy application. And at the end, I'm going to talk about current ongoing and future developments of radio astronomy instrumentation projects. So what is FPGA? FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. And FPGA is a uh, electrical component. As you can see in this slide, uh, it's a semiconductor device that is a square shape and has a lot of pins. And many companies produce and manufacture their own uh, FPGA uh, semiconductor device. So there are Xilinx, there is MicroSemi, Lattice, uh, Altera, which is now Intel and Atmel. I am I am I'm personally more familiar with uh, Xilinx and Lattice FPGAs, and they have their own. Each company provides their own uh, tools, uh, development tools, environments, and each company, each FPGA excels in a some way, and also uh, provides some features that the others don't. So it's it's mostly a, a personal choice 
which FPGA brand you choose for your application. So as we said, FPGA stands for Field Programmable, Programmable Gate Array. What do we mean by saying gate? Gate is the small uh, building block of any digital system. As you can see in this slide, we have, I, I have put uh, here three examples of gates, and, or, and not gate. They have, their, uh, they have inputs and they have outputs, which is we call it here Y. Inputs are A and B, the output is Y. So they, and, they, they, and it is important to know that uh, gates operate in binary system. So their values of inputs and outputs can only be uh, zero or one, zero or false, one or true. Zero is about uh, voltages uh, close to zero volt, and high voltages uh, like uh, five volt or 3.3 .3 volt is considered as one. The state of output or Y depends on the state of input. In the next slide, I have put uh, uh, an example animation of two example gates and and not. On, on, on the left side, we have AND gate. So as, as we can see, um, let me bring uh, a pen. Value of Y, value of the output, depends uh, on the value of inputs A and B, and is one only if both values of A and B are one. In any other cases, um, the value of uh, output is zero. And in the right, we have an in NOT gate or inverter. The output is uh, the in invert of input. If input is one, the output is zero. If the input is zero, the output is one. So and if FPGA can have um, millions of these gates, small gates here, in, in, uh, and, and, and FPGAs are programmable. So a designer can define how these gates are connected to each other. In this slide, we can see an example of an adder. So the output of this example, this design, is the summation of inputs, A and B. However, a designer might not like, might, uh, might, might want to implement a multiplexer. So they can change how uh, these gates are connected to each other and uh, they have their new design, which is a multiplexer. Here the output, it depends on the, on the switches, S0 and S1. And uh, uh, so by, by choosing the right uh, input, you can, you, you can shift the input to the output. So based on the switches that you have. So it's completely programmable. So in other words, we can say that gates are like Lego parts. A designer might uh, make it very simple design, maybe like a spacecraft or a submarine, or a designer might uh, spend time and design a very complex system like this person who have put all these Lego parts together to create a city. In our application, for a Pyre and EHT uh, projects, we use FPGAs for radio astronomy. Signal received by uh, radio telescopes are analog. So we convert, we need to digitize them, convert them to digital system, to binary system. So this, this is why, where FPGA played a very important part. So all this processing, digitization, and transmitting for recording uh, happens by like if done by FPGA. So FPGA is very important for us. But as I said, uh, there are some other uh, alternatives. We have uh, uh, there's another alternative called ASIC. ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So in 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 the, in right, you can see both FPGA and ASIC. At top we have FPGA. At the bottom there we have ASIC. They look very similar. They have they are they are semiconductor devices. They look very similar. They have many pins. So, but ASIC is designed specifically for an, an application or task. It can handle both digital and analog, and it's not programmable. So you cannot change your ASIC chip. If you want to do a new, if you want to use an ASIC for a new application, you have to design it from scratch, you have to design a new ASIC chip. So this makes it very expensive to have uh, ASIC chip. So this is where FPGAs 
are, uh, are uh, show their advantage. They are uh, cheaper, they are reprogrammable. So if you use FPGAs in your design, if you want to have a new design, you just need to change the how gates are connected to, to, to each other and then program your FPGA to, to do the new task. And the interesting thing about ASICs are they are very fast because they are designed for an application or a specific application, they are super fast. But uh, FPGAs are fast too, they are not really far behind ASICs. Also, there are other alternatives too. So we have a CPU, we have a GPU. Many of us have worked with CPU before. Many of us have done like uh, uh, C++ programming, Python programming. They are all, they are all uh, they, the, the main part of all those programs are done, uh, are uh, executed on CPU. Again, as we can see, they look like each other. They, they are very similar. Um, but so why do we use FPGA? So CPU stands for Central Processing Unit and GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit. CPU and GPU run your software, your application, your code uh, by, by, uh, by instruction sets. So when you compile your code, your, com uh, your compiler converts your code into a set of instructions in the background. You don't see them. You can write instruction uh, codes, but we use C++ or Python. So compiler com uh, converts your code into a set of instructions that are executable by CPU and GPU. And CPU and GPU read line by line and execute your code. But in, on the other hand, if PGAs are algorithms implemented in hardware, so there is no uh, 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 running instructions line by line, uh, your algorithm is implemented in hardware. CPUs can run very fast. They go all the way, like the new Core i9 uh, CPUs can go all the way up to five gigahertz. Uh, but if PGA and GPUs are at, uh, operate at a slower clock rate, they can go higher, but in average they are about 600 megahertz. So uh, why they are fast? Because they have many data pipelines. They can run an instruction set, several instruction sets at the same time. This is why they are really fast. They are used for accelerated uh, applications. The interesting thing about uh, FPGAs are they are very power efficient than more power efficient than CPU and GPUs. Especially GPUs are very known for their power thirstiness, so they they consume a lot of power. But in uh, FPGAs are uh, more power efficient. So we mainly use FPGAs because they are uh, algorithms implemented on hardware. H hardware is always faster than software. So this is, the main, uh, this is one of the main reasons that we use FPGAs. There are many digital peripherals uh, beside FPGA that we use that can, can communicate through digital protocols like I2C, UART. These are some communication protocols. Because we are implementing in hardware, FPGAs can communicate with them natively. You can just communicate with different digital hardware very um, by, by just putting some gates together. So this makes it easier to communicate with different peripherals and faster. And as we talked, it's cheaper to start. It's cheaper to have your prototype. And um, if you want to change your design, it's easy to do that. It's uh, easier than, uh, is, uh, than other alternatives to improve it and uh, change it. So all these reasons together gives us enough uh, motivation to go with uh, FPGAs. However, some places use all these, uh, all these alternatives together, FPGA, GPUs, and CPUs. Usually FPGA is responsible for receiving the data, and then it will pass to GPU to process it, to process it, to process the data very fast, and then it will hand it to CPU for user interaction or user management. Or at some places, uh, some applications, FPGA will process the data and it will pass it to CPU directly, and they don't use GPUs. But this is a very common uh, setup right now. They use all three, uh, processes uh, at the same time. So, as we said, FPGAs are only one component or one uh, electrical component. 
they, we cannot use them alone. We have to mount them on a board. Here we can see uh, FPGA in the center mounted on an evaluation board, and there are many other peripherals around it. Uh, so uh, FPGA can uh, communicate with uh, memory, it can communicate with um, USB ports, Ethernet, SD cards. There are other ports that we don't really need to go into detail, but we have FMC, FMC Plus, uh, it's a, a, a socket, or RFMC, that again is a type of socket. So FPGA will be mounted on a similar uh, uh, board, and we can program it to uh, communicate with all these peripherals around it, surrounding, uh, surrounding the FPGA. So programming FPGA has uh, about eight steps. First, you should examine the requirements, then writing the specification and documentation. Then we should write the code, simulate it, then synthesize it. There are many uh, automated tools for it. Then there's, an, uh, there's a step called implementation. After implementation, we generate the bit code and then we program the upload the code on the FPGA. So let's start from the step one. Uh, I will briefly describe each step. So first step is requirements. So what are requirements? This is a step that we should uh, really answer before starting the project. So when we want to work, if we want, when we want to use a FPGA for a design, first we should answer what does this project really want? And very importantly, how do we know that the project that we have designed is done? Because uh, you might spend a lot of time working on parts of your uh, the project, part of the design, which does not really contribute to achieve the goal of the, the uh, project. So this is an important uh, step to uh, first make sure everything is settled down, everything is done, everything is answered, then you should uh, start working on the project. In the specification and the documentation part, it's important to answer what FPGA architecture to use. As I said, there are many FPGA brands. With what brand are you going to use? Each brand has their own categories of FPGAs. What FPGA, what category is most suitable for your application? So, and this FPGA, what peripherals this FPGA is going to communicate with? Again, we saw that there are memories, there are Ethernet, there are SD cards. Which peripherals do we really need? And we should answer what clock speeds are really, what are the limit of the clock speed? What clock speed should we set for uh, the FPGA? What clock speed will break this uh, board? And, or in other words, FPGA cannot work at. So, if, uh, so the clock speed should be defined. And we should also answer how the FPGA is going to be configured. So the user who's working with the design that you have met have to, has to configure it. And there should be a user interface. You should answer the question how this user interface is going to look like. And also, it's always good to start documenting at the very early stage of the project, because it will help you in the future. If you want to change something, if you, if you come back to your code, you don't understand a part of it, it's always to start documenting at the very early stage of the project. When you are choosing FPGA, uh, it's uh, important to pay attention to the resources. Like, <clears throat> sorry. Like there are on-chip memory, they are fast, but uh, very limited. There are external memory that you might need to uh, provide for your design, like DDR. They are slower, but are available in much larger capacities. There are each FPGA uh, consists of, uh, consists of lookup tables, a small which are small programmable blocks uh, that you can um, define how they are connected to each other. You should look if your FPGA chip has enough of them. You should again look at inputs and outputs. What peripherals is it? Uh, do we need? Do you need fast Ethernet? Do you need serial transceivers? What clocks do you need? And so on, other peripherals. And also, what operate? What environment you are going to put your FPGA in? Is it going to go to space uh, for a space mission? Is, is it going to space? Or is it going to be used in automation, industrial automation? They are, they are, there are different FPGAs for all these uh, environments. So you should pay attention to those as well. Next step is to write the code. 
there are several level of abstractions that you can use to write your code. The first level is hardware level, uh, hardware uh, design language level, so or HDL. You can use Verilog or VHDL to write your uh, uh, code and make your design. Uh, you can use a schematic capture design, so you can put a gates in a schematic environment manually. You can use high-level synthesis or HLS. What it means is that you write your code, your behavioral code in C language, C or C++, and there are automation tools which uh, Vivado has provided, and each company had provided for their own FPGAs that will convert your C code into a machine language, to a hardware language. So it is it's very high level. Again, many people who have written with C, they can understand, they can write, they can immediately start using uh, HLS. And there are IP cores. IP here stands for intellectual property cores. There are, there are IP cores for Xilinx. They provide, uh, IPs like blocks that do a specific thing and you can just use them in your design as they are. You can just pick them, put them in your design and use them. Uh, so uh, there, are, there, are, there are different level of abstraction. So it, uh, it depends uh, which, which method you are more comfortable with to choose, to choose and uh, do your design. You can choose any of these. They're, they, they, they have they, again. They have. They might be. Some people might be faster in some 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 of these methods, but it depends on you. So there are in IP cores there are Casper blocks that I'm going to talk uh, in a minute. So here I have uh, brought an example of FPG and CPU code. So I tried to make them to look to do this the same job. We have an input A. We have an input uh, clock. And also, we have two outputs, B and C. In each code, uh, outputs are going to be equal to the input. So A will go into B, and A will go into C. In the left, I have put a very lot code. So if I, and I have put the timing diagram of this block code in the bottom. So as we see, when here, when the uh, rising clock age happens, we change the value of A to 1. It's an input, so it's up to us. We change it to uh, 1, to true. In the next step, uh, when the next rising clock age happens, both values of B and C will go up. Here we have put uh, A go to B, A go to C. So the value of B and C will go up at the same time. In the right, in the C++ program, the code uh, at the first, uh, let's say at the, uh, at the one clock, we change the value of A to one. In the next clock, let's say the instruction set has, re uh, instruction program counter has re reached to uh, line number seven, it puts B equal to A, so B will go up. But C doesn't change because we are still at line seven. In the next clock, it goes to the next line and it will change C to one, to or equal to A. You might say there are other clocks for fetching the data from memory. There are other clocks used for other things. That is true. I'm just bringing an example of how, I want to show how uh, different, uh, 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 how different is the execution of a C++ code and the Verilog code. So as we can see in C++, the code is uh, running line by line in different clocks, clock cycles. But in FPGA, all the lines happen at the same time. Everything, all, uh, all, everything that you see here will execute at the same time, together, all together. But and in the right, it happens line by line, so it requires more clock cycles to do the same to do the same job. So the question that comes comes up here is that, what if in FPGA we want to have some sequential behavior? So we want to uh, first do something, 
then do something else. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Uh, so there's a method called a state machine uh, that it lets you to do sequ uh, sequential, uh, to have the sequential behavior on FPGA. Let's talk about, let's bring, as an example, let's talk about a traffic light. First, the green light will go into yellow light, which had, it had, there are different states. Green light is, let's say, uh, zero, zero. Yellow light is zero, uh, zero, one. And then yellow light will go to red light, state one, zero. So if you, if you implement a state machine, you can have a sequential behavior on the FPGA. You can control what states, how, uh, how a state trans, transient, uh, trans, uh, transits to the next state. What are the conditions? All, are these, uh, all of these are possible to be done in an FPGA too. So maybe writing an HDL code or hardware defined language is difficult for beginners. And the tools that have been provided to do so is complicated. So, they have designed, there is a tool flow called Casper tool flow. Casper tool flow intends to simplify and facilitate the process of making FPGA design. Casper stands for the Collaboration for Astronomy, Signal Processing, and Electronics Research. So it is mainly uh, maintained in UC Berkeley. Uh, they have a group, uh, SETI. So uh, there are people in the group SETI that are maintaining this uh, tool flow. And it's, it's, this tool flow uses MATLAB Simulink and Xilinx system generator. There are tools. You might have heard of MATLAB Simulink or Xilinx system generator. So the uh, Casper tool flow will use both of these uh, tools to provide some custom blocks to the user. In this slide, we can see Ethernet block here. We can see ADC block here or different other designs in the, uh, in the left, this one and this one. Inside of these, each blocks are maybe thousands of lines of VHDL or Verilog code, but it's abstracted. You don't see them. The user doesn't need to uh, interact with them. So they have made these blocks. They provide the user with these blocks. And the user, a designer, can use these blocks in their own design, and they don't really need to care about the type of uh, uh, the, the uh, type of their FPGA board by saying that I mean how the FPGA board is connected to different boards. These are handled in the background, so you as a, as a user will choose the type of your board. You uh, just use the same block, and it will. Uh, and it will do what you want it to do. You don't really need to go into very detailed, um, <clears throat> detailed design of each block. The next step after coding is simulating. Simulating is the very important part of any design. Because uh, you can simulate your design in depth, you can see exactly what's happening what would happen if your code was on the FPGA? So if, if there are any problems, you can solve it before even going into the lab or in a real world, uh, on a real world uh, FPGA board and test it there. You, you can solve it beforehand. You can solve any problems. And there are tools. If you are using Xilinx board, uh, Xilinx, uh, uh, FPGAs, they, have, they provide system verilog tools and UVM, universal Ver verification method, methodology that uh, you can use to simulate your design. It's, it's a very important step of any design. It's, it's, it, uh, it, speed, it will speed up your uh, design. It will give you errors before even going to the real testing. Here in the example, here I, in the picture, I put an example of how a simulation will show you different uh, behavior of each signal, signal in your design. The next two steps are synthes synthesizing and implementation. So by saying synthesis, it means 
analyzing the code and determining uh, required resources. So when you make your design, they are, there are uh, then there are some resources need to be allocated for an FPGA uh, chip for your design. In synthesis, it will uh, try to find the required resources. And in implementation part, which happens after synthesizing, is how to, uh, def how to, where to put all those resources on the chip and how those resources, how those gates, how those different parts in FPGA are going to connect to each other. This happens in implementation part. It is important after these two steps, look at the reports, the timing report, the use resource utilization report. If uh, there is not enough uh, space or resource, uh, resources available on the FPGA, it will tell you, you should probably go back, uh, change your design or change your FPGA chip. Or if there are any timing issues, timing conflictions, you should go back to do, uh, look at your design, change parts and do these two again and see the report, the new report. If everything is fine, you can continue with writing a bit code file. It means in the implementation part uh, uh, section when, where we determine which resources on the chip are going to be defined, are being going to be allocated for your design. We are going to write it in a file. So, basic application specific integration circuit. Uh, but now, because of all these uh, benefits of FPGAs that we talked about, FPGAs are getting more popular or more preferred. And there are new radio telescope observatories are being built or just opened. And FPGAs provide a fast design prototyping and implementation. So many of these observatories are using FPGAs for their designs. And uh, new FPGAs are being developed. They provide higher speed and bandwidth. So uh, they are getting fast. So this is another reason that in radio astronomy, we are going, we are using FPGAs more and more. I have brought some examples of different radio telescope sites that use uh, FPGA in, uh, extensively in their uh, backend, digital backend. For example, here, this is the fast radio in China. They are using Casper and uh, FPGA, Xilinx FPGAs in their backend. And uh, this telescope is in West Virginia, in a town of Greenbank. They are using FPGAs for Vegas project, if, uh, pulsar searching, uh, uh, they look for pulsars. And uh, they use uh, F uh, FPGAs for their FFT engine, uh, like FFT, they do a lot of FFT uh, on the FPGA, and they use FPGAs for correlation, for it, and or also it is called X engine. This telescope, a uh, uh, submillimeter array telescope in Mauna Kea, Hawaii. There are eight six-meter telescopes. They uh, they used to use, I know they used to use ASICs, but now they have switched to Casper and FPGAs. They use, as I said, there are eight uh, dishes. They are used Roach tools of uh, uh, Casper tools and FPGAs for uh, correlation engine. And uh, they multiply signals together. Correlation engine, it means they multiply signals of different uh, telescopes together. And they use FPGAs for uh, FFT. They, they take F uh, FFTs of incoming signals from uh, space. And they use data transmit, uh, they use FFTs for data transmission to record the data. 
So here I've, I've put some pictures of their backend. Um, here, uh, here you can see the FPGA boards. They called Roach twos. They are just they just a Casper uh, Casper name for FPGA board. So it is a Xilinx board. Xilinx FPGA. So they have they are using uh, FPGA as their backend. And also here in Arizona, uh, we have a 12 meter kit pick telescope that we are going to use uh, FPGAs on it for uh, uh, signal processing and again transmitting the data for recording on a disk. So, so yeah. So the next example, which probably many of you are familiar with, is the Event Horizon Telescope project. Uh, which uh, revealed the first image of a black hole. Interestingly, um, FPGAs and Casper have been used have been used in all telescope sites within this array. There are there are so for 2017 data there are, there were about eight uh, uh, radio sites radio telescope sites. So in all of them, FPGAs played an important role in receiving and uh, processing the data and then uh, sending them to for recording and uh, yeah so in this array in this project fpgs played a very very important role what about the future so uh, in uh, pyre and ehd projects are working on next generation of telescope signal processing hardware the next generation of signal processing hardware includes uh, fast ADC. So, uh, uh, so the, the, the ADC, the number of uh, sampling per second is increasing significantly. Uh, this is a collaboration between Asia A in Taiwan, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and University of Arizona. We are working on a 100 gigabit per second uh, Ethernet system, which uh, is a collaboration between us and CFA at uh, Harvard Smithsonian. And also, we are uh, designing the a fa a fast spectrometer for 12 meter kit pick telescope, as I showed in the previous slide. And uh, currently, uh, that's, that's, that's an ongoing project here in Arizona as well. So this was my presentation. I will now take any questions. And I have put a, a, a survey link. There are, I have put two links here, a short and the long one. They, they go to the same location. And on the right, there is a, a binary uh, uh, barcode. So if you, if you just take out your phone and uh, point your camera, magically, there will be a link at, uh, like showing up. And you can. Uh, go and fill out the survey. Thank you so much. Thanks, Arash. Um, so uh, we are getting questions in through the chat. If you have more questions, um, please post them, and we'll uh, I'll pass them on to Arash. Um, Arash, um, can I start uh, with uh, one of these questions? Sure. Um, someone asked. Um, about um, implementing CPUs uh, on FPGAs. Um, there are uh, IP blocks that, that allow you to do this. Can you talk about that and when you might use it? Sure. So I, I, I have actually put a CPU on FPGA picture here. So in this slide, and that, that's actually a very good uh, question. So in this slide, we, have, we can see a block here called MicroBlaze. MicroBlaze is a CPU that if you put, uh, put the IP in your design, it is a CPU that on, on the FPGA. So you can write C code for it. You can, uh, uh, you can it, it supports some instruction sets. You can write your uh, program in C and up, uh, upload it onto a SD card and let MicroBlaze CPU run it for you. There are other uh, CPUs on chip as well. So this is called, uh, uh, which are, I'll write it here. Uh, I don't know if they provide. Uh, 
uh, yeah, so it is called um, Zinc. Oh, sorry, my handwriting. So you can use there, that Zinc is another uh, CPU on chip. So why do we use them? Because, uh, so you don't have to. Anything can, can be done through uh, gates, through digital logic. However, many, many, many applications are faster to have a micro blaze on or a CPU on their design and they write their code in C. You can have I2C communication, you have, can have Ethernet communication, you can have uh, uh, UART communication, and you can pass all of these works to micro blaze, to a CPU to do for you. You don't really need to get involved with uh, designing all the uh, code for. Uh, different uh, peripherals that a CPU can handle much easier. You can spend your time on more on a specific part that you want it to be happen in on hardware, on algorithm that happens on hardware, is executed on hardware, which is fast, and you want other parts of your design to be handled by the CPU. So you can go and use one of these CPUs in your design. Thanks. Um, just this triggered a follow-up question, but um, how fast do the do these FPGA based you know uh, synthetic CPUs run? So these CPUs, uh, I know uh, they work with about. Um, so you can change the clock, but they they are usually at around uh, three hundred megahertz. Yeah, is that they, a typical clock range for um, uh, FPGAs? Uh, so FPGAs can go higher too, like five hundred. Uh, like uh, as I said, the average clock speed is about 600 megahertz. But uh, yes, in um, the typical clock rates for FPGAs that I have worked with are about uh, 350, 300 megahertz. Yes. Thanks. Um, in a slide around here somewhere, you mentioned uh, lookup tables. Can you yes. talk about what uh, they're good for? So. Someone might ask, like, uh, how the how the gates of an FPGA can change how they are connected to each other. Are there any mechanical parts in FPGA that you can uh, that change how gates are connected to each other? The answer is no. So they they use uh, lookup tables to define how different parts of uh, uh, your design are going to be connected to each other. So. To do that, they use lookup tables. They are a small programmable blocks that can be configured based on your design, based on your uh, application. You don't really need to configure them. You write your code, you write your, you can configure them manually, but there are tools that do it for you. Um, you know, we talk about clock rates of hundreds of megahertz, but, um, that doesn't sound very fast for modern electronics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when for the Event Horizon Telescope, for example, we're ingesting data at um, on a single FPGA at more than 10, uh, well, of order 10 gigahertz. How is it that it's possible to do something like that if your FPGA is so slow? Okay, so that's a good point. So as you said, FPGAs, Run um, at very low, very low clock speed uh, in compar comparison to like CPUs. So how do we get such high uh, speeds and uh, performances? That's because uh, let's look at uh, this example. Maybe this helps. So when you write your Verilog or your code in for FPGA, everything happens at the same time. So here we only needed uh, two, slug, two clock cycles to change the value of B and C at the same time. So it's like doubling the clock rate. So in the CPU, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we had to do, uh, we had to spend many clock cycles just for a simple task of changing the outputs to equal to input. But in FPGA, there are several parts that work at the same time. So there are, or we can call them maybe pipelines. There are several data pipelines that transmit the data, process data at the same time. This is how we get very high performance and uh, uh, 
speeds. So, or in, I, or in short, I can say that since in FPGA, there are several parts that run at the same time, this will allow you, allow the uh, designer to design a system that can achieve very high uh, performances and speeds. Okay, so, so basically, um, you know, you can use the FPGA logic to create a bunch of parallel paths. And so rather than stepping through a series of instructions like you would on a CPU, as long as you can get the information to all those parallel paths at the right time, you can process them all and merge them if you needed um, in order to do a lot of computation at once. Exactly. Okay, uh, that brings up another question uh, that came in from online. Um, uh, so when you look at a timing report, you talked about simulating and um, synthesizing. Uh, how do you know um, when, uh, uh, when the timing is too close, when, when you might uh, have a clash, a timing clash, when things might not line up the way you expect them to with everything going on at the same time? All right. So um, if you are using, uh, let, let's start it like this, like answer it like this. So if you are using a, an IP block, for your design, the designer of that IP block uh, has written probably a documentation. I mean, uh, so if you go and look at their documentation, they will show you a sample uh, waveform of how this IP should work. So when you put it on your design, when you look at the simulation uh, simulation outputs, you should match you should uh, match your simulation with their documentation. You should see what you expect to see. If you are not using any if if you if if you are not using any IP blocks, so and you are implementing everything um, from scratch. From very uh, uh, very low level, every everything from uh, for yourself. Um, again, the FPGA that you are you are using has provided a documentation of what would be the uh, clock limit, how fast you can go, how uh, slow you can go. So you can based on the documentation of the FPGA that you are using, you can uh, you can. Uh, uh, like, the, uh, so that's 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 where you define your clock. So in Simulink, if you're using, uh, okay. So the thing is, uh, an FPGA. If you have a very uh, uh, simple design, the clock speed can go very fast. You don't really see. You might not see any artifacts, any wrong results on your output, but. When you are designing for a specific FPGA, you should consider their uh, specification of the FPGA chip. So, uh, so based on the documentation, as I said, you should define the clock rate. And when you simulate, you should see you should see what you expect your digital logic to do. If you don't see it, you have probably you should go and change uh, how. Uh, 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 gates are connected, are interacting with each other. But if it works, you sh uh, and you have set the right clock cycle, clock speed on the FPGA board, you should expect that your code will work on FPGA too. Many times uh, you don't see any clock artifacts on, in simulation, but uh, that you can see on the real board. But in the simulation, you can see that your code is actually producing the right output. Um, when you uh, when you're simulating this, um, mm -hmm. are you writing a bunch of test problems, test test situations for the the fake chip to evaluate? Is that how it works? Yes. So when you when you create your design, you should uh, create another file called test benches. So when you create test benches, you fake the inputs. You give some uh, inputs that you know what the output is, should, should be. 
So when you give those inputs as an input of your design, you should see what you expect. If you don't see that, you should, uh, you should go, go and look at the waveforms and see where the problem is coming from. Uh, then I cannot hear you. Sorry, can you give more examples of the, uh, the sort of IP blocks that, that might exist that come from say Xilinx or even from, from Casper, which isn't quite IP, but what, what sort of things have people provided to make it easier to do uh, FPGA programming? So um, let's, uh, okay. So as an example, uh, let's go to this slide maybe. In this, in this design down here, we can see about five blocks. These five blocks uh, are designed by Xilinx. So again, the user doesn't really need to go into details how they are designed. So these designs are called, uh, these blocks are called AXI interconnect. AXI is a protocol of how data is transferred from one part of FPGA to the other part or from external devices. So uh, so one of the, one of the examples of, of IP block that they provide is how they connect different parts of a chip, different peripherals of a chip together. The other examples of IP blocks are UART, serial communication. So you can, uh, they have provided UART blocks. You can put it in your design and have serial communication with uh, user uh, program on, on the, your computer. Or you can have Ethernet IP blocks. So you can connect Ethernet cables and send data from FPGA to somewhere else. Again, might, that might be a com your computer. There are IP blocks for CPUs. Right now here we can see a CPU, a microblade CPU. You don't need to implement the whole CPU yourself. You can just use this IP block on your, in your design and it will provide you with a CPU, soft CPU. They, it is called soft CPU. And there are, there are many, many other uh, cores. So, if you're using a Xilinx FPGA, if you go to their Vivado uh, programming env environment, develop a developing environment, they have a catalog of different IPs. You can uh, go through them and see if they have provided your, uh, your uh, required IP core. If they have not, you can uh, look for, you look it for online. There are people who, have, who work on these IP blocks and they put it online so other people might need them and use them in their blocks. We, you know, in our context, we're normally using these for signal processing. Um, is there a lot of, you know, digital signal processing related IP blocks directly from Xilinx or is it? Yeah, uh, so there are IP blocks for FFTs. Uh, you can do FFT. So and in this, this talk, in this talk, we talked about radio astronomy in uh, application. Some people uh, might use FPGA for optical telescopes, or some people might use FPGAs for video, uh, video processing. So there are um, cores available for those applications as well. There are FFTs for, uh, to, uh, to do FFT uh, uh, fast Fourier transform um, uh, operation on your signal. There are uh, memories. You can store the data on the memory. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you, you mentioned that FPGAs are lower power than CPUs and GPUs. Um, if your application is to try and implement calculations or uh, a system at the lowest power possible, uh, can you talk at all about the, the best practices for getting uh, an FPGA system to be low power, um, you know, whether it's sleeping or uh, operating part-time or um, you know, on a specific schedule or anything else that you're aware of that, that helps you implement that? So uh, one, one practice that I, uh, one practice that I try to implement in my designs is to uh, disable parts of the uh, chip that I'm not using. So, there are uh, FPGAs can have that too. So 
FPGAs can go into a sleep mode. So when you are not using it, you can trigger a signal, take FPGA into the sleep mode, which will use almost, I mean, very, very, very uh, low power. So if you are not really using the FPGAs or uh, your uh, chip, it might be a good, uh, good thing to take it into a sleep mode. And uh, so, and also the new, the new, uh, the newer FPGAs are made, they are making the, uh, um, the transistors or the uh, parts of the uh, gates smaller. A smaller gates means lower uh, power consumption. So, yeah, so I think taking uh, this FPGA chip into sleep mode when you're not using it can save a lot of power. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, another question. Um, so how does uh, universal verification uh, methodology, UVM, um, it's uh, uh, an acronym I wasn't familiar with, how does that help you debug an FPGA? Design? Oh, so um, I have personally, I, I haven't used, uh, I haven't used UVM. I have used System Verilog to do, to do, to do uh, debugging, but I know UVM is another method to debug the code. I haven't really used them, so I cannot really, I might, I might it's better not to answer that question. Okay, well, I, I refer uh, uh, the questioner to uh, Vivado documentation. Um, thanks. Uh, so, you know, as a sort of closing question, um, how do you do? You have any suggestions for how people could try to dip their toe in FPGAs? You know, how could they get started playing with an FPGA? Is that even plausible? Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, first of all, there there are many uh, uh, beginner boards, evaluation boards that they can start using. They they can uh, get an evaluation board for about thirty dollars, which is relatively cheap, and also. Uh, they can start with learning uh, uh, HDL code. They can do simulations. They can generate a lot of these waveforms and get familiar, get uh, like familiar and comfortable with this. And and also, uh, yeah. So there are many low end uh, beginner chips available for. Uh, enthusiasts and uh, who are those people who are really interested to make their hands dirty and start using FPGAs. How, how would someone go find something like that? Uh, so uh, maybe, I mean, I have got, uh, I've got them through like uh, um, just Googling, but, uh, but maybe, but, but. I think that's a fair answer. <laughs> Yes. So, um, but maybe the, I don't know. I don't know how that uh, how, how how if that really works. But maybe they can get help from student clubs in their university. They usually they might have FPGA boards, digital boards, uh, so that they can go and play with them as well. That might be an option too. Okay. Well, uh, we're at the end of the hour. So uh, uh, thanks a lot, Rash, for uh, leading this webinar. Uh, I want to direct everyone's attention back to uh, the link to the survey. Or actually, you can go to your last slide. Uh, CK also dropped it into the uh, into the into the chat. So hopefully, you can see it in um, in your uh, that helps us uh, prepare these webinars and improve them. Um, and I'll drop it in there again right now. Uh, and Thank you very much for participating, and uh, I refer you again to our website for, for future opportunities to uh, interact with the Black Hole Fire program. Uh, Thank thanks, you. everyone. Goodbye.